Hello, everyone. A happy Tuesday to you all. And Steve, welcome back. I feel like I haven't seen you on dailies in a little bit. Have you done a daily since South by? I, I have not. So my next question for you is, can you tell everybody what your favorite movie of South by 2024 was? Well, first of all, I want to apologize for the construction outside my window. Uh, the There's a lot going on. Uh, and I don't know. I mean, look, it's I hate saying this because it's a big budget movie, but I really did love The Fall Guy and I really loved Monkey Man. And they're both bigger. The you know, Fall Guy's a big movie, Monkey Man, not as much. Uh, so for bigger movies, those are my two. But for like indies, you know, like South by movies, I really loved Bob Trevino Likes It. Mm. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else. I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Three Body Problem, which premiered there. That's a huge budget Netflix show. Uh, you know, I actually, I thought that South by this year was much better than Sundance in terms of the quality of movies. Like a lot of the movies that came in our studio really enjoyed and I would mm -hmm. recommend. Uh, it was a really good year for movies there. Between South by and Sundance this year, I already have a lot of movies in my back pocket that I feel like I'm going to be heavily considering as favorites of the year when, when December rolls around. And I mean that earnestly. Yeah, I mean, the biggest issue, though, of course, is that Dune 2 didn't play at either of those festivals. Mm. So, you know, I love that movie. And uh, if you have not seen it in IMAX, see it while you still can, because it's incredible. Dune 2 is indeed quite good. You know what else is really good, Steve? A day of Collider Dailies when the headline is <laughs> Jurassic. <laughs> Jurassic. <laughs> Steve, I'm so excited for Jurassic World 4. So the latest news on the next installment of the franchise is that Scarlett Johansson is in talks to join the cast of the new movie, which of course will be directed by Gareth Edwards. So before I, I blab and my, spin, my head spins out of control with enthusiasm, I'll let you go first, Steve. But what do you think about Scarlett Johansson potentially joining this cast? Uh, I think it's... Uh... It became a movie that all of a sudden a lot more people are going to be interested in because uh, she is a very popular actor. People really love her. Um, it adds a movie star to the franchise. Uh, I think it's great casting. I think it's good for the franchise and good for her. You know, she's been doing a lot of like great work in indies, whether it be Asteroid City or the list goes on and on. But this is like a big summer blockbuster you know, um, th th it's great. Listen, it's great all around. And I also think that putting Scarlet in the movie is going to open up the other roles to bigger name actors that might now consider doing Jurassic in a way that maybe they hadn't thought about before because, you know, you get to work with Scarlet. She's a huge draw. The only issue, of course, is, is this the first of a trilogy or is this just a solo movie? Because no one knows that information. No one knows the time period. No one knows if it's a spinoff. No one, no one knows anything. So, you know, signing on to this, um, a lot of people have to sign for two or three pictures mm -hmm. and you know, that's a whole thing. It's a hard, I have a hard time imagining a studio like Universal with a property like this signing actors like Scarlett Johansson without making multi-film deals. But I'll just reiterate, one of my dreams for this franchise is that they run into the anthology format instead, where we get to see very distinct versions of what life is like when dinosaurs roam the earth alongside humans. So I would rather see the story go in that particular route. But with Scarlett Johansson potentially signing on, I do think they're probably going to do a multi-film deal with her and turn this into not necessarily a trilogy, but a series of films at the very least. Her signing on makes me super happy. One, because Obviously, she is incredibly talented, and I'm sure will elevate the material, but also because she is a very busy actor, and I have to imagine she gets loads of offers and opportunities, and if she deems this one worthy of her time, I have to imagine that they've got a good idea here, and that she's got a lot of faith in Gareth, like, like I do, so I think that bodes well for the project, and then just to touch on what you suggested with 
her signing on and it potentially opening the door for other big name actors to sign on. I kind of hope they go the other way with this. Now that you have a Jurassic movie headlined by Scarlett Johansson, pick some people that are either total newcomers or on the rise in their career and use this as an opportunity to give them a big old star power boost. I, I find that that winds up being one of the most exciting things. And also, and again, I know this is me saying what I want and not necessarily what they have planned, but if you have a major star like Scarlett Johansson and you know, you, you pair her with a bunch of lesser known actors who are super talented, I feel like you could have a really good balance of you know, like big ba budget popcorn studio movie, but also something that feels just grounded and real enough so that it has an attachment to the original Jurassic Park movie and that movie's texture. Yeah, listen, they're obviously going to cast some people that are up and comers, but you need to cast another name or two because ultimately you need um, you need to put people in this movie that can go on talk shows and can that have social media followings now. And I believe that what they're going to end up doing because everyone now realizes it, that you have to have someone younger uh, who's a star, um, you know, or appealing to um, younger moviegoers as another lead. So I think that Scarlet has a big audience, but I think you got to cast someone who's like 20 to 25. That is a draw for younger fans because they want to see someone like that in the movie. And I think it's really important. And I think they will. Um, and again, like uh, we just don't know enough about this movie to know what's going to happen. But I'm going to make the bold prediction. Ready? Mm -hmm. I'm going to say this movie takes place in a city. Does this have anything to do with that comment? Oh, that's funny. I, you know, what's I did hear about that, um, but I, I don't know if that is the. I think that's a BS rumor. Although it's a good title, but I, I just have a gut feeling that this is a. No, listen. You have to have Jurassic or it's going to be something like that. But uh, I do think it's going to take place in a city and not on the island and not. It's going to be a very different film than before. Will it take I, place in San Diego? I have absolutely no idea. You know why I say that, right? <laughs> Lost World? Oh, uh, I, listen, I just think that you can't. The Jurassic movies are very similar. And I think you need to do something very different for this one. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you're going to say they're all different, but they are, they're, you know, they're, I, I really think you need something radical for this one. I, I think being in a city or just something very different. I don't love the title Jurassic city. Cause the first thing it made me think of is like Sim city. Like all of a sudden it feels like a game where like you build your own Jurassic park and you make your own city with it. So I don't know. That was just the first thing that crossed my mind when I saw Jurassic City. But I will say that kind of, you know, leans into what I've been hoping for with the franchise, because I think that one thing that kind of diluted the concept a little was how it went bigger and bigger and bigger, but, you know, didn't really have very meaty storylines and the thematic heft that I would like it to, but I think containing it to a smaller area and maybe a smaller ensemble could really strengthen it in that particular respect. So I am hoping they go that route. And I mean, Jurassic New York City. Yeah, look, I mean, ultimately, <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be like wish fulfillment for me. Look, uh, Jurassic City is a very easy to get behind. Listen, you might not like it, but to the like average it. person, yeah, it doesn't matter. To the average person, though, they know what they're getting with the movie. You know, like, uh, anyway, look, let's get past the title because we really don't know. And we don't know the location. We don't know anything. Um, but, I, I, listen, Scarlet getting cast is, is really good for all parties. I wouldn't mind all in the game if they learned a little bit from, from Prey. I don't think it would be a one-for-one one in this particular case, but I do think Prey is a good blueprint for other franchises not necessarily to replicate but to learn from and adjust their own franchises and their continuations from so i think this is a really good point to make all right speaking of continuing franchises our next story is about another one it is the pirates of the caribbean franchise so pirate six has been in the works for a real real long time now and we just got a little bit of an update on it from jerry bruckheimer who of course is the producer of the franchise it comes from comicbook.com and during their conversation 
Bruckheimer was talking about how they are still forging forward with the continuation of the franchise, but he noted that he wasn't sure if Pirates would get going faster than, let's say, another franchise like Top Gun. Here's the exact quote he gave. It's hard to tell. You don't know. You really don't know. You don't know how they come together. You just don't know because the top because with Top Gun, you have an actor who is iconic and brilliant. And how many movies he does before he does Top Gun, I can't tell you. But we're going to reboot Pirates so that it's easier to put together because you don't have to wait for certain actors. So, Steve, what is your take on the timeline for Pirates? And are you happy to hear that it is a confirmed reboot? So the first thing I have to say is I'm frustrated and I'll tell you why, because I did the junket for ministry with Jerry Bruckheimer and he was paired with Guy Ritchie and I didn't have enough time to ask him a pirate's question, which was absolutely on my list. So I hate losing a story to somebody else. Uh, I think rebooting pirates is the way to go. Um, And also because you can hopefully set it up in such a way that, you know, you're going to God willing make three to five movies, all new cast, uh, you know, the issue, of course, is Johnny is so iconic as Jack Sparrow. Um, but I, I do think that Pirates is a very popular universe slash franchise. And I can understand why they want to go back to it. Um, the question is, can you repeat the magic? Because, you know, the first Pirates movie is, you know, I was going to curse. It's fantastic. And um, uh, but yeah, I think rebooting is the way to go and all new cast and figuring out what they want to do with it. Yeah, I'm happy to hear they're going the the reboot route with this. I think uh, the idea of Pirates of the Caribbean just has like a wealth of like ideas and corners of that world to explore and different personalities. And, you know, in terms of recreating the magic, it's, it's just about casting hugely talented people with maximum screen presence who could play with these types of characters in these types of worlds. And there's there's no doubt in my mind that they're out there. So I think it's just about finding the right people for those roles. But, you know, in general, I, I do think a lot of the Pirates, some of the Pirates movies are very good. I think the, the mythology and the story threads that they were working on kind of did spin out of control. So I think also from a story perspective, it is best to have a hard stop and then a refresh to to forge forward in a way that you know shows off pirate six as a movie that will be for people who loved the original films but also serve as an on-ramp for folks who want to get into it but don't want to feel the pressure to revisit all those movies and all that mythology that came before it so this feels like the right path and part of me based on his comment based on his comment is thinking that you know i I feel like Pirate 6, if I'm to guess, I I don't know any information, obviously, but I feel like that's something that is going to happen sooner rather than later. Um, It's going to be interesting. I I don't know if it happens. I don't know what they're going to do because, listen, this year we've talked about this. This year is a really big year for the movie industry because box office last year was really down and like the numbers of this year are going to determine a lot. You know, are movies going to, and we talked about this, are movies going to make a billion dollars this year? Dune might not make a billion dollars, the Dune sequel. Not that it was expected to make a billion, but that was as, you know, that that's a movie that possibly could, but there's all these movies this year from Deadpool and Wolverine to, I mean, there's so many movies that are big name films that will or won't they perform and hit the billion dollar number. And or is the new threshold 600 million for worldwide or 800 million? And these numbers are going to determine the budgets and IP going forward because, um, you know, we've seen a lot of original IP uh, performing, whether it be Barbie or Oppenheimer or, you know, Wonka, although that's not, um, you know, that's still a spinoff of something, but it's more original than, say, Pirate 6. And you look at the box office of The Last Transformers and some of the other movies that have been mined a little too far, and they're not performing. So anyway, what I'm saying is this year is going to determine, I think, whether or not another Pirates movie ends up happening. And if it does, what the budget is going to be. I do definitely think the results of the box office this year will influence when that project moves forward and how. Next up, our final uh, topic of today's show is the Godzilla Kong first reactions. The movie premiered. The social embargo has lifted. Steve has seen it. Before I toss it to you, Steve, I pulled a couple of um, of uh, social media responses. 
First one I have here is from Eric Goldman, who said Godzilla Kong is a really great King Kong movie. The human stuff is noticeably clunky, is notably clunky. Poor Rebecca Hall saddled with so much dry exposition. But Kong has so many scenes centered on him, and I just loved the big guy. And the final fight sequences are pure monster mayhem delight. If you're asking what about Godzilla, he's cool per usual, but even more than Godzilla versus Kong, where he was such a menacing threat to Kong, he's more more of a not notable, all-powerful lurking presence waiting to unleash, which is fine. He gets movies all the time. Next up is Tessa Smith, who said Godzilla Kong the New Empire suffers from an extremely slow start due to lack of dialogue, which is more cheesy than entertaining. When Titans go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, the action is incredible, but that's not enough. Looks pretty, but unfortunately misses more than it hits. And then finally, Jermaine Lussier. Godzilla Kong, the new empire is underwhelming. It feels like 90% set up for a final battle that's solid, but can't live up to all that buildup. There is a fresh approach to the characters, which works, but it never quite gels with the main story. Dan Steven does rip though. All right, Steve, where, where do you fall compared to these particular reactions? Uh, okay, so I really enjoyed Godzilla Kong. I wanted out of this movie, just to be very clear, I wanted monster mayhem. I wanted Titans fighting. I wanted very little human stuff. And that's what the movie is. If you're interested in seeing monsters on screen fighting crazy shit with Titans and not a lot of humans, this is the movie for you. Okay. Okay. I had a, I had a feeling it might go that route. I'm not sure if I've disconnected or Steve's disconnected. So just to be safe, I'm going to keep blabbing right now. Am I back? Ah, you are back. It was you and it wasn't me. I was getting worried. But um, that's some that's some solid insight. Um, I'm, well, I'm, uh, I'm, not done, I'm not done yet. Oh, Dan, okay. Stevens, Dan Stevens is actually fantastic. He's the best human addition in the film. Uh, he's very good. But look, I mean, I just wanted like I just wanted monsters fighting. And I just want, you know what I mean? And that's what the movie is. So it's a popcorn and soda movie. It is not, you know, Godzilla minus one is like a masterpiece. This is not that. Hmm. This is like the spectacle of monsters fighting. And if you're looking for that, absolutely pay money to see this because you will get it. I mean, when I see it, that is what I want. I want to see, I want to see Titans fighting. But one, one big wish I have had for this particular franchise and franchises like it is for them to get the human characters right, to have a little depth, a little logic. And, you know, the the mention of Rebecca Hall getting saddled with a whole bunch of exposition is disappointing because I think that character in particular and her skill set has been wasted in that role. So, you know, it's a bummer to hear that that's the route they're going with her character. But I'm still, you know, I'm still curious. The behind the scenes team, I'm a big fan. I want good things for them. So in conclusion, I am mixed on whether or not I'm going to see it this weekend. Uh, I, we're running the Collider IMAX screening tonight, oh. uh, and I'm going to sit through it again because I did not see it in IMAX the first time, uh, and they filmed part of this movie in IMAX, so I would imagine it's going to look awesome. But, like, let me be very clear. Godzilla Minus One is a masterpiece. Monarch is the show to watch if you care about the human mm -hmm. characters because you have 10 episodes, and there's Godzilla stuff, but it's mostly the humans. And this movie, Godzilla X Kong, by, War by Warner Brothers and Legendary is the film that has the budget to do the monster stuff and to like just feature monsters fighting because you need a hundred and something million to make a movie like this. And the thing that they did that's very smart about it is Adam learned, Wingard, the director, the thing about VFX is if you keep on redoing it in post-production, that's where you keep spending tons of money. But if you go in with your previs figured out, knowing what you want, and you are very clear with your vision, you can maximize your VFX budget because it's the revisions that cost all that money and the changes. But I spoke to Adam and they didn't change things. They went in with exactly what it, they wanted with the action. They had it all figured out. And that's why there's so much of it in this movie because they weren't reworking it. So all the money goes on the screen. Mm. And like I said, if you like watching the monsters fight, you're going to get it and it's good. It's a good reminder that I should get around to binging Monarch in the near future. It sounds like it would be for me. Yeah, um, Monarch's good. 
That right there is a wrap on today's edition of Collider Daily. Steve, before we sign off, can you tease something that you've worked on that people should check out? Uh, I have absolutely no idea. Oh, I'm doing the nothing. Uh, except I'll say that we're doing. I'm doing the WonderCon panel on Saturday with uh, the directors on directing. Um, it's at one or one fifteen in room two hundred B, North B. Uh, it fits like 2,000 people. We have West Ball, Radio Silence, and David Leach for the new Apes, Abigail, and uh, The Fall Guy. And we're going to have exclusive footage from all three films. And uh, it's really going to be a good panel. So if you're going to WonderCon on Saturday, I would suggest uh, stopping by. Very, very cool. Take note of that, everyone. And before we sign off, I will just tease my South by interviews that went up recently that I'm really happy about. One of them is The Uninvited, which stars Walton Goggins, Elizabeth Reeser, and it was uh, directed by Nadia Connors. It's her feature directorial debut. And to me, that movie is an example of a true acting showcase. And we really delve deep into what it was like for all of them to work together as scene partners. It was a great conversation. And then the one going up today, shortly after this episode of Collider Dailies, is Lily Singh's new movie, Doing It. That was another like blast of a conversation. And I think the, the premise sounds really promising and like it explores the sex comedy subgenre in, in a way we haven't quite seen before. So check that out on Collider.com and the Collider Interviews YouTube channel after dailies. With that, I will say have a wonderful Tuesday, everyone. And I believe tomorrow, I'm not going to say names and put anyone on the spot because I don't remember, but someone will be here in this little box doing Collider Dailies tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern. Have a good one, everyone.